Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Burns, I'm a professor here at the Kennedy School. I want to welcome you all here today. I see a lot of students from the Kennedy School. I see people from outside the Kennedy School, a part of the Boston Cambridge community. You're all welcome. Uh, I'm looking forward to a great discussion this afternoon. We really um, are very pleased to welcome Ambassador Zalmi Halizad to Harvard and to the Kennedy School. I think a lot of you know something about him. You've probably Googled him. Yeah, met him before. He's really one of the most outstanding figures in recent American diplomacy, and quite unusual because uh, between 2001 and early 2009, he served in three successive, very demanding but very different ambassadorships for President George W. Bush. He was our initial ambassador to Afghanistan following the fall of the Taliban, and uh, we were just talking. Uh, in my office, what a, a relatively positive time that was. The emphasis on the word relative. Uh, because the Taliban had been chased out of Afghanistan, largely. And I remember in my visits in 2002, 3, and 4, there wasn't a lot of violence. And there was progress being made, certainly, with the Afghan government because of Zhao's leadership. And of course, a lot of that has now disappeared. Zhao then went to, and I asked him, what's your toughest job he's ever had? He said, easy. Iraq and was there, uh, I would say, during the crucible, the toughest years after the military phase, after we succeeded when we had to begin to defend ourselves during a very difficult occupation and during a time when the, um, when, when the momentum events was not with the American government and American military, but Zhao was a brilliant representative of our country at the most difficult and then he became, and this is where he and I began to work together, when I was Under Secretary of State, he became our ambassador to the United Nations, a completely different set of responsibilities. He followed a person named John Bolton, who had been the American, and I will say this out here, uh, who had been the American ambassador to the United Nations, and I told Sal just before he went off to New York, I said, you know, all you've got to do is walk in the front door and just smile at him. <laughs> <laughs> and shake your hands. And it was a great success. And what I admired about <laughs> what I admired about Zal in that position, and you know, there's this interplay in diplomacy between the capital, which is not very far from New York, just a couple hundred miles. But it's sometimes a scene longer. And in New York where um, uh, we were working together. What I admired about Zal was he was, he's a doer. He's a diplomat. He's a problem solver. He was not there to make speeches. He didn't denounce the United Nations. He supported it. And while the United Nations is highly imperfect, it is a place where you can get things done. On behalf of both your own country and the rest of the world, he's out there, that spirit. And he was tremendously affected upon their ambassador. So I'm really pleased he's here. Um, thank you, Val, for giving us the time. And I'm going to introduce him to you. And he's going to say a few words. He's going to address Afghanistan, because if he can address any of these issues, and I asked Al, at some point, could you focus on this issue? This famous question that General Petraeus asked many years ago, how does this war demand? What's the road to peace? What's the diplomatic arrangement or deal that you think, Sal, and Michael Semple here, Michael can talk to us as well, Tom Simons can talk to our former ambassador to Pakistan. Is there a deal to be made between President Karzai and Taliban with the involvement of the United States in What would that deal look like, and do you think it's even achievable in the next year or two or three? So that's your mandate. Sal, thanks for being here. Please welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nate, for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I would like to uh, say a few words uh, uh, of introduction about the topic, and then uh, given the talent that exists in the room, uh, I think uh, I look forward to uh, an exchange of views and comments. Uh, Afghanistan's future, I think, is a contingent uh, uh, future. Uh, uh, there are, at least I see three possibilities for it, uh, uh, and uh, which option or possibility becomes dominant or more likely would depend about how those several key variables uh, mix uh, uh, or reconcile uh, or not. Uh, one is, uh, of course, our own role and the role of the United States uh, as the dominant external power uh, with uh, lots of troops and resources now over there that I wish I could have had even a portion of my own <laughs> ambassador. Uh, and and uh, we know that Home, uh, 
progress uh, that uh, has been made and, uh, or has not been made. And uh, given the contentiousness of the relationship uh, uh, that now characterizes the, rela the, the relationship between the US and the president of Afghanistan, which was not always the case. There was a period, I was lucky to do when I was the ambassador, that it was a very Period uh, almost, except when I was uh, out of the country. So uh, I would, a lot of people at the embassy uh, felt neglected because I, I was the third president. I do have some responsibilities <laughs> uh, 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 at the mission uh, in terms of my morale of the staff to spend time with them as well. Uh, but uh, you know, we, we had, the, the reason I make that point is that we were uh, very closely coordinated. Very little resources that was available to me uh, at that time, uh, but this, this cooperation we were we were doing uh, quite a lot. Uh, and uh, but now uh, the fatigue here uh, is, a, is an issue of how long will we stay at this? Uh, and if people perceive that we are not going to stay there for very long, how does that affect prospects for? And how does, uh, what kind of a deal can one get in that environment uh, when there is a, uh, there is a, a belief that, uh, that we're not going to be around for very long? Now, just to say what value this variable can pay, uh, there is, a, a, of course, at the present time, a, a perspective to get a, a, an agreement with the president of Afghanistan, with the government of Afghanistan, uh, that the U.S. will retain even after 2014, when the leadership for security of the country goes into the hands of the Afghans, some significant number of, of troops for a, maybe an indefinite period, maybe 10 years subject to renewal or termination at that time. And this strategic partnership framework agreement, uh, which will be followed by a status of forces agreement, will determine numbers of troops, localities, missions, and all kinds of issues. Quite a number of us have been involved at one time or another dealing with task force forces agreement uh, is a variable. Now, uh, if the current trends continue, will the desire to maintain that kind of a posture uh, be there? Uh, will uh, 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 um, uh, the Taliban, if there is negotiation, willing are we to put that presence issue on the table as a variable. Uh, we have been seeking to conclude this strategic partnership agreement now. In fact, President Obama won, uh, at one point had said he wanted it done before the announcement of the drawdown last July, but it didn't happen. It still hasn't happened. Uh, I think a couple of issues that if you're following the issue, as some of you are, are standing in the way of the Afghan uh, Louis Jirka that was by the President of Afghanistan, gave the mandate uh, to conclude it, uh, the, issues, the issue of uh, prisons uh, that are run by the United States military. President Karzai would like that to be terminated and be turned over to those prisons to Afghan before he concludes it. The Loy Jirga said as soon as possible, gave him some wiggle room, uh, and uh, we have proposed a plan or timeline for that transfer building Afghan capacity, uh, uh, and so on. And the other issue is the night operation. Again, the Goy Jirga said, as soon as possible, Karzai said, no, terminate now. Uh, only Afghans should be able to do night operations, particularly going into Afghan homes. And, uh, uh, you know, we're training very rapidly, John Allen, uh, our commander there is, uh, is working very hard for battalions that have already been trained that can do night operations on their own with that, with, without any U.S. support. The target is 12, and they're really moving very fast. When the 12 are, uh, are in place, then we don't, uh, they can do it all on their own. And this is a personal thing for the president because his military, his interior forces, the ministry, his intelligence all say, we're not ready to take on this role, Mr. President. And he said, well, 
whether we are ready or not, I don't want the Americans to, to do this. So there is a question whether President Karzai has made up his mind whether he wants the strategic partnership or not, or is he waiting to see where things are going uh, and where does everything, including uh, his own role, fit in it as to uh, regarding this strategic partnership. <coughs> but there is no question that, that, uh, that uh, uh, two things in my mind, at least, that most Afghans like a strategic partnership agreement to be, to be concluded with the United States. They're not in, uh, as happy with us as they were at the beginning. There's no question about that. Uh, when, when I was there, I used to tease the President on occasion uh, when, uh, when he used to complain that our forces were more popular than he was. So that, yeah, that, that, you know, be careful not to criticize uh, the people who the Afghans like so much. So that it's not politically a good thing to do. But in any case, that has changed now. There is uh, uh, some significant increase in dissatisfaction. But, uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, they fear abandonment more. Uh, not at the level, <coughs> but they fear our absence even more, especially given their own history of post-Soviet period where uh, you know, the world abandoned them. As this is their self-perception and that, uh, and that uh, uh, terrible things happen in Afghanistan. So, how does this variable work out uh, of uh, the American presence? Uh, how much of an interest driven to some extent by domestic, or maybe to a large extent by domestic uh, policy? Where do we go as we, uh, as, uh, on this issue internally? Certainly depends on other variables, but, that, uh, but it also depends on how the Afghan government reacts. So we're not going to say, in my view, uh, if uh, the Afghan government, President Karzai, That happens, we would leave. In my view, I used to tell him, "Look, if you really, I mean, I say it as a private citizen now, and I see it. If you really think we are as bad as you think we are, you should ask them to leave. And if you did, it, I mean, that will be a decision you'll have to explain to your people. And if you did that, uh, I don't think we will say, who, 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 who the heck are you, uh, so to speak, are staying? Uh, no, I don't think we would behave that way. So, but uh, 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 that's that's one." shaping factor, and the question is in a settlement context, which I will come to is a key point, what would those who have a role in the settlement, who can either help with a settlement or hinder a settlement, how would they perceive the U.S. role in this? And I think the key players are, are, are of a different views on this. Not everyone shares uh, kind of uh, the, the perspective of the United States on sort of wanting a residual force Two, the Afghan domestic uh, scene. Normally in political science courses I used to teach at one point in my career, uh, when we talk about the uh, future of country, we largely focus on internal uh, things, which obviously in the long term are dominant. But I think in places like Afghanistan right now, it's only part of the story, an important part, but only part of the story. And there, uh, uh, of course, there is no question that most Afghans I mean, I would say predominant numbers, and I, uh, I could say this with confidence, although uh, <coughs> I like these Republican opinion votes supporting it, one piece. There's no, I mean, that's a no-brainer. Because they've lived in 30, for 35 years, they've lived in conflict. And this has had a terrible effect on their psychology. On the one hand, they want peace. On the other hand, since they have lived in this very uh, terrible set of environment, in which they have seen the worst things you can imagine, I was heartbroken, uh, I didn't make this mention, but you most would know that I was born in Afghanistan. Uh, I, was, I, I, was, uh, you know, I went to elementary school in Afghanistan. I went to part of high school in Afghanistan. So I came to the United States when I had finished uh, the 10th grade uh, a sophomore year <coughs> in Afghanistan. So I, I, I have a very uh, clear recollection. Uh, well, I didn't come as a one year or two years old kid who would uh, not have any memory. And when I went back to Kabul after some 35 to 40 years, somewhere in that range, uh, as the, representing the United States, uh, initially as a presidential envoy, I was, uh, I, I, I could not believe what had happened uh, to, to Kabul, to the capital city. And it wasn't done by the Soviets, what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, it was 
done after the Soviet departure, different groups of Afghans, uh, some ethnic, some ideological, some both, uh, uh, throwing rockets into the city. Uh, uh, rockets that were pretty, pretty primitive uh, rockets, uh, not sophisticated accuracy. Uh, 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 and, 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 and people have seen things that, uh, you know, see their parents, their, their kids, blown up to pieces, the, their world uh, uh, go upside down overnight. The psychological effect of this is something that is making Afghan politics very difficult, which is people are becoming, have become extreme short-term members in their thinking. How do I survive? How do I manage in this very insecure and uh, kind of uh, 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 predictable environment? So they tell me when I talk to them as the American ambassador what I like to hear because that, they think that would be helpful. Karzai, they tell him what he wants to hear, that he's a hero of Afghanistan, that he is uh, the, 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 the best person since uh, Ahmad Chaudhrani, the founder of modern Afghanistan, that he should, you know, he's standing up to the foreigners. And so. They go to the Taliban, they say, well, at least under you we have peace and security, Islam was secure, we, really you ought to come back. And they talk to their own leaders and they say, and, 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 and so it makes this situation a little difficult and unpredictable. Can you speak with confidence uh, about the future in the in environment if everybody is thinking uh, here and now, uh, rather than uh, what is it the long term we want? Uh, how do, that comes when you are a bit secure. Then you think, uh, what do I want over the long term? How do I get from here to there? And I, Stu, if I remember one thing uh, from my time in Kabul was constantly pleading with the, uh, all that I could, think longer term, follow up. Decisions are not just now when we decided, decisions mean an implementation, follow up. And I used to tease the government that we need a ministry for follow up here because there was a lot of decisions <laughs> made. I mean, there was an uh, enlightened decision for the most part. But uh, then people would go back to, you know, what do I do with the for tomorrow, with, well, I would get them focused on it. What do we do over a three to four year period? This or this is to put the country on the right path because you can't get it fixed in one day, although we can make a little progress, but progress towards an objective. But when I went to Iraq, I heard that I found out that the Saddam Hussein had a ministry of planning and follow up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> right, so, <laughs> it didn't work very well. So, therefore, I don't know whether my advice was smart of them not to take it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, so, and now on the peace process, uh, the Afghans are very divided, so the question is, uh, you know, the Northern Alliance, uh, there are key figures who benefit from the continuation of the conflict. <coughs> that unfortunately, a fact of life, they, they profit from a situation in which it is semi-rule of law. It, it's not an entire rule of law, it's not an accountability and, 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 and part is psychological, part is force of habit, part is uncertainty about the, the, the American dimension that I talked about before and any peace process to last will have to have not only the agreement of, of, of the protagonist that we normally think internally the Taliban and the government but the broader Afghan policy because there has to be peace which hasn't been really made since the end of the Soviet between various Afghan communities, ideas, forces, as to what kind of a country they want and how, what terms can they reconcile with each other on. Now, we tried uh, in my service in Iraq and Afghanistan, and both the timing was such that I had to help with the constitution of, of both countries. And if you see sometimes, just for you, use, there are paragraphs that are identical in both constitutions, and that has to be got uh, of my present largely because on something that I had instructions from people like Nick and, and others to get the human rights situation and the role of women and the 25% representation of women in parliament. They are exactly the same in both constitutions because we were really, those are the things we really cared about and I said, well, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to explain this to the American people or to the leadership in Washington as to we came, we did all the sacrifice and 
and there is uh, no recognition of rights of women or, or, or minorities or kind of tolerance uh, 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 in terms of religious uh, rights. So in any case, making peace uh, uh, would be difficult in any case, but it would be more difficult if it's not broadly participatory in the Afghan context. Uh, I think President Karzai alone cannot make this peace. I would, uh, my advice to him would be you need to bring the political forces of Afghanistan uh, to the table. Uh, and and, and they, there is a, a, not a consensus on, on, in terms of what kind of for a federal <coughs> structure in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, some of our politicians are getting involved in, in this, saying, well, this should, the future of Afghanistan should be like this or like that. Uh, I try to say, to them, look, let them figure this out, because uh, people would love to have us dragged into this, uh, and then say, well, this is the American design. It was from the beginning. They wanted to do partition Afghanistan and so forth. But I think this is an issue and that, uh, that will be that will very difficult, and it's difficult also because the, the term of the president runs out in two years, uh, and he can't run again. And, 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 and so, and, and, and there's all kinds of issues about what he's thinking about. You know, he said he won't run, but that the Constitution said he can't run, but what does he want to do? Uh, 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 there are all kinds of issues that intersect with, with, with the issues that I just described. Third variable is uh, the, the, uh, the neighbors, particularly important is Pakistan, but I wouldn't uh, underestimate the role of Iran, Russia, and India, and to a lesser extent Saudi Arabia in this. Besides ourselves and our allies, which uh, I, 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 you know, we are the 500-pound gorilla right now on the scene, by so this, but uh, and, 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 and particularly important is Pakistan because. Uh, Because of the Soviet war, uh, that uh, we helped the Afghans, we helped them through Pakistan. The Pakistanis have gotten to know Afghans very well. The history of relations was never very good. Uh, uh, could, uh, remember that Afghanistan felt that its territory had been taken by the British Raj. From them, these were Afghan territories that uh, the Raj pressed forward. Pakistan was being created. In fact, the royal family did not weigh in very vigorously on the issue. But subsequent to it, I mean, there are various theories as to why that happened. They took a very clear stand against Pakistan membership of the UN. The only country that voted against Pakistan. And, 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 and the Soviet period, also quite a number of Afghan groups who were being supported by us through Pakistan, developed or long-term uh, and some tactical relations with the Pakistani institution that dispersed the assistance. You know, when you're a refugee, in any case, you're the, under the influence of the host country's security institutions in that part of the world because if you need a work permit, if you kid has to go to school, if you need a passport to travel, if you need to raise money, if you want to bring weapons, if you want to fight, well, you have to deal with the security apparatus of the host country. But when there is masses of money and weapons coming in, dispersed through that institution, as it was the case, and uh, I have to admit that uh, I was part of the cabal that did some of that at that time. Uh, I, 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 Nick did not mention my earlier service in the US government in the 1980s. Uh, uh, this had a lasting effect. Pakistan-Afghan relationship. I think the Pakistanis have felt that that level of sacrifice that they did and assistance that they did entitles them to, uh, to, to maybe that's a too strong a word, they should have a relationship with the, uh, with the Afghanistan that uh, at the minimum is not a threat to them uh, uh, or it has to be uh, of a very close uh, nature uh, and you know Afghans have uh, their own theories of And unfortunately, that during the last ten years, we in Pakistan, we I mean the United States and Pakistan, have been both allies and adversaries in Afghanistan. It's very paradoxical. Maybe a set of countries, which maybe a number might be fewer, or large. I don't know. Maybe some of you would want to look at this. That you cannot call them either allies or not call them enemies. They are. 
either and you're both. And how do you deal with a, a phenomenon like that? And, and that's what Pakistan has been. We have relied on them, on counter-terror in Pakistan. They have been helpful on, on, in a lot of cases. Not in every case, not always to the degree we would have liked, the time we would have liked, the way we would have liked, but a lot, a largely helpful on allowing us access to Afghanistan through the airspace, helpful uh, we, we, for some of our operations, and also to, certainly helpful to ground resupply. But at the same time, uh, they have uh, allowed sanctuary of those who are fighting us uh, in, on their territory. And it's my judgment, based uh, on a lot of experience, that they are helping them. And there's no question that the kind of operation with and breath that is taking place, that couldn't happen spontaneously by people without the kind of being trained and resupplied and, and so forth. Now, they do not, I have uh, had a, 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 a hard time myself from the, the days I was in Kabul and President Bush once sent me to speak to President Musharraf because I used to complain in the NSCs and others from Kabul chiming in about that we need to att pay attention to this Pakistan issue because sanctuary was being developed. I used to, I'm sacrificed once in a while, I used to tell me that I was focusing too much on that. But uh, 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 well, finally they said, what, you know, you go talk to President Musharraf yourself, because you're right next door. And I uh, pleaded with him, frankly, because I said, look, you know, I'm a son of this region, I told him. I'm going to be very frank with him, Fred. And I know all the game. <laughs> this is natural to this part of the world, and I, 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 I can say once or twice I have played it too. I, <laughs> I just told him very frankly, and I, and I am here to help uh, to, to, to solve a problem. And I had President Karzai call him the night before. He said, "Look, it's all is coming. He's, uh, President Bush called you that he's coming. He also represents me. I mean, he said I was in the, in the room when he made that call. That whatever you know, I mean, we want to solve this." whatever problem there is, uh, and, uh, and if you can work it out with the United States, you have my vote. The President Canada, I was thought, uh, you know, those were the uh, honeymoon days, so you know, I don't think he will say something like this right now. <coughs> I, I could not get, uh, uh, he could not bring in, uh, 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 and then maybe he didn't know, I can't uh, read the map, as to why are you allowing a sanctuary? If you could tell me, Mr. President, what's the problem, Maybe, given my American representation, given that I know the Afghans so well, because I, many of them in the 1980s I had helped when they were fighting the Soviets and so on, maybe I can find a way to solve this problem. Right? Once and for all, because you're an ally, and Afghanistan is an emerging ally of ours. And I'd like, to, uh, for the President uh, Bush, uh, I would like to solve the problem. And he said, where are the problem? They're not in Pakistan. Flatly, they're not here. You're not here, give me their phone number, give me their address. Uh, and, 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 and I said, Mr. President, the leadership is called the Quetta Shura. And Quetta <laughs> is a city in Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, so finally, of course, after a lot of back and forth, I mean, this was three or four hours uh, kind of meeting, not one of these uh, kind of five minutes kind of uh, endeavor. Uh, we used to, I thought it was not going anywhere. And to this day, I mean, that comes to this point about Pakistan. Without Pakistan supporting a peace process, in my view, it would be very difficult to get a complete peace process. You may get, you know, and we did this in Iraq, win over a small group here, uh, you know, rent somebody over there, <laughs> uh, uh, make a deal with somebody else uh, in another place that belongs to that group, but it would be very difficult although I know there's a strong Taliban resentment amongst the Americans against Pakistan. You know, uh, once you people get to take your money and your uh, uh, weapons and your assistance, then you start telling them what to do, of course, because, you know, who, who wants to give these things including without reason and condition? And once you start putting condition, the recipients start resenting you. Uh, and being angry, uh, what do you think we are? Um, we, are you your soldier? Uh, we're an independent people. So now some Taliban are beginning to uh, distance themselves from ISI and from Pakistan. But the question uh, is, uh, can
can they can there be a deal with the Taliban as a whole without uh, Pakistani support? I am quite skeptical myself of that, and 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 and, and therefore I have said that we ought to work with Pakistan. Maybe uh, we can reach it in an understanding with them, although the record is not very encouraging. I have to say that that uh, what they want in Afghanistan may be something we can live with. And then uh, as part of an overall deal, we can, we can, we can uh, encourage uh, a, a settlement of the conflict. Now, uh, one last point. Uh, 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 and, uh, and depending on how you evaluate prospects on, on, on the Pakistan variable, on the Afghan variable, on the US variable, there is one other thing that I think uh, 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 we, we, we need to, we need to uh, consider if we have it. I think that uh, I have, uh, myself have been of the view lately that given the complexities of the regional relations in particular and the complexity of the Afghan uh, situation, we need to work at yet another level. We should work at the regional level with Pakistan. We should work at the Afghan level, but we need to add one level, which uh, uh, may be harder or, or, or more difficult than uh, the very distinguished diplomat here who could uh, have views on it, especially Nick. Uh, and, and that is, uh, I think we, uh, the big powers, Russia, in my view, China, some of the European powers, and perhaps a rising power like India, we have broadly, uh, the Indian one is a little complicating, a uh, fact that we need to think about carefully. We can agree, in my view, uh, maybe easier to get an agreement among us as to what kind of Afghanistan we could live with in terms of what relation to Pakistan. But we all, I don't think, I mean, the degree of urgency varies. We have had a more urgent view of the terrorism threat and some others. But do none of our interests are served by Afghanistan returning to be a sanctuary for extremists and terrorists. I think on that, we could agree. And then, other interests are secondary so forth. And if we could come uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the kind of a big power agreement, the, uh, I've used different words on that in private, that do. and then we work together the regional forces, because we alone have not succeeded with Pakistan, despite our best efforts in our system. They also think they have other options, you know, the, not the US, uh, the China option, and so on. And, 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 and uh, uh, then if we are in China, uh, and they may be eventually bringing Turkey and Saudi Arabia in at a certain stage, I just think we need to go in stages, but stage one would be the core of core, which I would be, the, 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 uh, uh, then we don't deal with Iran, I think Iran is a player in Afghanistan, it would be a mistake to not to, 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 to believe that, uh, and so who can work the Iran account, we can't, uh, 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 in fact, the, Iranian may like us for the near term to be there, just as a potential target in case the deterrence uh, option, in case of an attack on them. Uh, so, and then uh, 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 in moving to uh, a settlement as we work the, the, the Afghan dimension, where the UN can also at, one time, at the right time play a role in my view. Uh, and sort of between the various Afghans and the regional players. But the top uh, uh, level, I think we have not really worked it as hard as we, as we could. Uh, uh, where does that leave us? Last, uh, very, very last point. There's a lot of uncertainty clearly about the future, except one thing, which is the, the domestic situation is changing here. Uh, uh, so the American role cannot be sustained at the current level. Can we prevail uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the strategy of cutting back, building up the Afghans with a smaller force without the other things? That, I think, uh, is, 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 is remains a, a question in, in my mind. And so therefore, the sooner we start with the, with the process uh, that, uh, that, uh, that involves these other layers uh, toward the settlement, uh, the better it would be. I'm, I'm, now I raised a bunch of issues. Uh, I think to, to, to conclude them, we need a lot more discussion and, 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 and focus analysis. But I'll stop there, and Nick, if that's OK, uh, or I could elaborate on any of these issues that you want. Thank you very much.
ask you about the first variable that you raised, the um, role of the U.S. Um, and the significance of the external factors in the Afghan issue. You justified Afghan's uh, lack of capacity to have a long-term vision on the basis of the conflict and violence they have been through for the past four decades. I have concern, and I hope you would address that, about U.S. foreign policy's capacity to be long-term in terms of its vision. And I'm saying that on the basis of U.S.'s foreign policy during the Cold War and the role that the United States played in, I would not really say creating, but definitely arming and strengthening Islamist radical parties. That the U.S. is fighting right now, sure. there. Sure. And that was, it seems that it was not a long-term vision. It sure. didn't have a long-term sure. vision. And that makes me question U.S. foreign policy's capacity to have long-term vision now. And how do you see that? Because at the end of it, Mr. Ambassador, it's not foreign policies of different countries that's at stake. It's people's lives that are at stake in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and people are dying daily, including U.S. soldiers. Sure. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate that. Well, nice to see someone from Afghanistan here. Uh, uh, on the U.S. ability to pursue long-term strategy, I know that uh, even some theorists, uh, going back to the talk well, have argued that democracies cannot have a sustained long-term policy because of election cycles uh, and, uh, and that authoritarian regimes tend to do better uh, 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 because uh, there is not as much domestic uh, and, uh, and imperative uh, uh, driving uh, policy considerations. I believe I'm a contrarian contrarian on this issue. But I, I think that if you look at the US strategy with regard to the Cold War, uh, it lasted uh, how long? Uh, half a century or more or less. Uh, and we per uh, persisted uh, uh, surprisingly. There was obviously adjustments here and there, more of this, this of that, uh, election cycles. But nevertheless, the, the US persisted. Uh, uh, very long time and, uh, and did it well. Uh, now, that doesn't mean U.S. hasn't made mistakes. That, uh, I think the mistake about which you spoke, Afghanistan, was uh, something that uh, it's good that we're in an academic uh, environment uh, to, 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 uh, to focus on this rather sharply, which is that uh, it's very satisfying uh, to assume at the beginning that you know the end of something. Uh, makes your job easier. If you know how something will turn out, that you can convince yourself that you know how something will turn out. Uh, it makes the, your job easier. Uh, so and that's the mistake we made about the Soviets in Afghanistan and maybe about the Soviets in general. Perhaps in Afghanistan I know quite well because I like but I was involved in some of the discussions at that time. Uh, and in fact, I was involved from an academic position uh, from Columbia University, where I should teach um, who had a relationship with the State Department at that time. And, and th it was that the senior leadership and the intelligence for a long time in the U.S. believed that the Soviet would prevail in Afghanistan. Ultimately, it would prevail. That was the assumption. It was not a, an unreasonable assumption given the history of Soviet intervention in neighboring states when it had turned uh, left pro Soviet, uh, it was the one way street, so to speak, the Brezhnev Doctrine. Some of you were not even born there in these guys. <laughs> no, some of us were staking place. <laughs> so, and, that, and therefore, the, the, the name of the game was how to make the consumption of Afghanistan difficult. So they would learn a lesson not to. No, very few people thought there would be a post-Soviet Afghanistan. And so therefore, you, you, you're absolutely right uh, that uh, uh, the kind of assistance that was given to the kind of forces that received the assistance was not thought through about post-Soviet, the implication of that. And, and, and once uh, it became clear, and a lot of people were skeptical and, and, and as to when they became convinced the Soviets were going to leave, some 
saw it coming earlier than others. Others remain skeptical to the very end that the Soviets were going to actually leave Afghanistan rather than some game they were playing. Uh, it was adjustment uh, is also difficult to adjust in time. It is not easy to once you have set uh, you have set on a course uh, to change that course, especially in a country uh, like the United States, uh, with all the systems players and all that was hard. So that I think you're right to point out to, to, to that, although from a narrow interest point of view, some would argue, wow, we got more than we, uh, we thought the Soviet would, consumption would be hard. The Soviet got defeated, they got out. Afghanistan may have helped to the, uh, uh, in, the, in the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Uh, it was a good investment, but, but, you, but your point is well taken now. One other thing on the longer term thing, uh, which is, I think even in the current environment, America can pursue a long term <coughs> strategy, in my view, in a place where the interest is obvious or uh, can be demonstrated, two, and the strategy people have, can have confidence in, that it's working. I think you run into difficulty when people either think the interest is not clear, or two, and that we don't know what we're doing that it isn't working, uh, that the strategy is not being effective, that you know, people come and brief the, uh, and say, well, things are going well, and people see something what they regard to be different. And there you think you, uh, you undermine the prospect for really doing a long-term strategy in a democracy in a sustained way. Yeah, that becomes very hard. And I think you know, what you're seeing in Afghanistan, one that they, some people are beginning to think the interests have been satisfied specific uh, to uh, your role uh, while you were there uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and that was the way, the way I see it as a simple citizen uh, was the start of uh, uh, one of the most corrupt uh, government in the world, I would say, uh, uh, which kind of supported the uh, poppy pop, uh, cultivation uh, corruption as we are all aware of and, uh, and, and farce 2009 elections. So I'm just curious what role and what discussions uh, were you ever a part of during those initial years uh, and, and did the intelligence ever show that this is what's been developing because I think the, it seems like US policy makers took their eyes off the ball during those initial years which kind of cultivated into this kind of a government of Afghanistan. We can all blame other countries all the time, but how, many, how much has Afghanistan taken responsibility for their own affairs while being in power for eight, nine years, Mr. Karzai? And how much role you specifically played in those early years? So 
Well, uh, first, you're right to point out that there's some of the weaknesses on the Afghan side. Uh, that, that is undoubtedly uh, uh, true. The issue of, for example, corruption, you, you, you pointed out. Corruption is uh, uh, quite endemic, but uh, although when you talk to the Afghan leadership, uh, they point out that this is sort of across the region, it's, it's, but the Pakistan is quite a corrupt. Corruption is widespread. If you talk uh, to some of the other uh, countries in the area, that this is kind of is the, the, the perception, the belief about what's corrupt and what's not, uh, is, is different. Uh, it's, you know, <coughs> we have a definition here, but there are people who think that a certain percentage of the budget going to their kind of personal side is not corruption. It's, it's entitlement. But in the case of Afghanistan, there is no question that corruption is an issue. And in my judgment, part of it has to do with the, with the lack of accountability of by the Afghan government the leadership, which you point out to, and I agree with. Part of it has to do with the short-term thinking uh, that I mentioned before. People saying, you better take care of yourself while the going is good, because you don't know how long this is going to last. Uh, and, 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 uh, issue of, of, of narcotics, <coughs> we write uh, uh, again about that, although narcotics was an issue also before. Neither, none of this is new. Although on Omar, the last year, when he was in power in Kandahar, if he, 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 he said uh, that producing poppies was outlawed, that they couldn't be produced. But the reason for it was because the stocks that they had was so high that they thought the price of the stocks they had would go high if they didn't produce for one year. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it was market manipulation more than kind of for price uh, reasons rather than, uh, uh, than, uh, than a, a, a genuine desire to end uh, uh, poppy uh, uh, cultivation. Now, I think the question of blame uh, issue is Afghans have to take responsibility. You're completely right about that. This is their country. If they don't, uh, how can they expect others to do so? Absolutely right. But it's also true that the neighbors are not good neighbors to, towards them. Uh, that is an unfortunate thing that for some of us would look very surprising because uh, we, you, you can't really, the problem that I've had uh, personally is that one cannot get a, a Discussion, perhaps I couldn't, but I don't know who has had that discussion as to why are they doing what they are doing uh, and what can satisfy them so they stop doing what they are doing that's unhelpful to the neighborhood. I have felt at times that uh, this is like old Europe. Uh, if, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't mean old Europe in the sense of Ramsdalian old uh, Europe. <laughs> what I mean is that sometimes people have felt that in the weakness of their neighbors there is opportunities uh, for you, kind of speak, uh, or avoidance of problems. Uh, because in Afghanistan, that perhaps, I'm not saying that Pakistan believes that, or I even do that. I don't know that. Because I, can, I, I can't, uh, I've not had that conversation. Well, if you're strong, Maybe it will push its claim, territorial claims, uh, uh, too hard. Uh, and, and therefore, a weak Afghanistan is better than a strong Afghanistan as long as the territorial issue is not resolved. To, 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 because Afghan Pakistan is stomachs in the status quo power. It wants the border recognized. It's the Afghanistan that perhaps would like to uh, have the border adjusted so they get more, perhaps, territory. Is that the case? Uh, uh, that they therefore uh, fuel the fire, so to speak, uh, uh, by uh, giving sanctuary. I have said to, to, to my Pakistani interlocutor when I talk to my talk with him uh, that if I was in their shoes, what I would say is either I would say to the Afghans, look, uh, we want our border issue resolved, we want the water issue resolved, the Indian presence, what, what the Indian presence, what sort of, what is the issue, what kind of Indian presence? One time they said, we don't like these two consulates that India has in, in Kandahar and Jalalabad. So, uh, is it a media here or not? Uh, is it, oh, is it, oh, so I can't go into more detail than that. But I offered them a solution 
for this. Uh, would you do but a Sal, let me just tell you, we, there is a camera here. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you're, you're on the record. Yes, yeah, sure. So I, that's all I'm, I got. That. <laughs> <laughs> so I offered them a practical solution. I wonder what, how to deal with this issue. If it was a genuine issue uh, uh, to, to, to deal with. But uh, uh, I think it will take a long time. In Europe, for the region to become a normal region, uh, unfortunately, it may take decades. We would like to see it happen, and therefore, until then, one has to work on the, of course, internal uh, thing because these uh, the, this functionality regionally and internally have some relations with each other. But we have to work the big power dimension more. So that's why I think coming from that dimension may be maybe more more fruitful. But uh, but. Uh, it's a tough one. I, I, I'm not absolving at all so for uh, the, the Afghan side, the problems that it has had in, in dealing with the real problems that it's facing. Uh, your, your point is well taken. Sharif. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm Sharif Basir. I'm from Afghanistan as well. Bashamadeen. It's, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. My question is related to the last point that you made uh, with regards to the solution. Yeah and reaching a peace, uh, and then you mentioned the big powers to come together and find a, a way uh, 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 to the conflict, to, uh, to, to bring peace. And I find that it's again yet another uh, solution that's going to be made in uh, outside Afghanistan, sure. in uh, capitals of sure. big powers in Washington, being sure. Beijing. Uh, I thought that may help, but wouldn't it be more helpful if you go downwards and down to the people, because the people are ultimately going to make peace, the Afghans themselves. And I think you mentioned the psychology of the people here, that they have been affected, it's true, but I think they can also, uh, they are also, they have a lot of resilience, and they have also uh, survived and coped with this uh, terrible years of war, including myself there, and I think they have the potential to, to, to make peace from bottom up, not again uh, a decision to be made somewhere in these big capitals and imposed on them. And I think that element I saw is missing from you, Sunshine. Well, I, I, if, 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 I, I didn't mean to send it that way, that it be a piece that is made and imposed. No, I didn't mean that. I meant that we have to work at the, our, our three, our all three levels. You're absolutely right, and I couldn't agree more that for it to last, the Afghans have to come to terms with each other and make peace. No question about it. But how do you facilitate that possibility, that, that, that potential opportunity uh, which uh, Afghans have to come to terms with each other? Right now, I, uh, one would argue that, uh, I, as I mentioned, the point of the issue of the government itself versus the Afghans uh, uh, generally. Then there is the neighbors, uh, their interests. Uh, I thought, maybe uh, I'd be happy your comment on it, that I think the big powers at this time, at this time on this issue, seem to, can, I can conceive of it, to have more of an interest in empowering Afghans to come to peace with each other. And if they could, because their interest is rather limited in Afghanistan, in extremism and terror, frankly, I don't, I mean, largely as a fundamental interest, besides some of the human rights values issue, that if we, they could come and then they could work the regional dimension more, I didn't say so much with the people of Afghanistan, their role, that they would have to uh, deal with the regional dimension, but a complicating factor uh, uh, to make it an enabling factor. Uh, and I believe that Pakistan, for example, legitimate interests have to be taken into account in any settlement that Afghanistan shouldn't become a source of threat to Pakistan. I mean, that, I think without that, it won't work. To facilitate this, what you say, and I don't mean that you shouldn't work at the other dimensions. I mean, we continue, we should there should you work at the uh, Afghan to Afghan level? Absolutely. And there should be a regional kind of uh, effort. But I'm saying that this uh, potential, powerful uh, influence to be positively brought to bear has not been mobilized as much. Maybe it has been. I, I, but I just, just have not seen it. Uh, that, that's what we're, we're adding to, uh, to, to, the, to, to, the, to the discussion. Can 
I just say, Sherry, I think it's a really good question. I would support Zell in this respect. Um, a piece in Afghanistan is going to be multi-level. Yes. So there's no question that the internal debate among Afghans is the most important part. But without you know, Pakistan, India, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, China, the United States, Europe, you need that level too. And historical comparisons are always inexact. But I would cite uh, Catherine's country, Germany, very rough parallel. They fought a vicious, brutal war. The country was destroyed and dismembered and divided. And they had a chance 45 years later to do two things between 89 and 90. There was an internal German dialogue between East and West Germans. And there was another dialogue, uh, Soviet, French, British, American. You needed both. And I, I would think as a, as a structure, you have to, you have to build that multi-level diplomacy okay. to end this terrible war. Uh, Tom. Yeah, I'm, uh, and just so I can identify, Tom Simons uh, was American ambassador to Pakistan in the 90s. And Poland. And Poland as well. Okay. <laughs> and Zal and I were on the war deck during the, of the U.S. government during the heat. Right, exactly. During the second period. Zal, I have two questions which are domestic. So they relate to your domestic variable. And I ask them because they also relate to the prospect for negotiation. One of them is, is it fair to say that during your time, we stayed too long with control of the power ministries by the minority in Afghanistan, and that this was one of the triggers for the Taliban resurgence? That's the first one. The second one is, if you're looking for a prospect of some return to a pre-1973 situation, you know, I, country with a government that can negotiate with its very decentralized province, something like that. Isn't the destruction of the last 30 years of local authority arrangements and structures going to make it very difficult to bring all these Afghans together for a productive uh, uh, negotiation among themselves? I mean, arriving at a consensus of what they want. I mean, isn't Afghan con Afghanistan now condemned to some kind of warlord? post-war warlord structure of authority that's going to uh, be hard to mix together at any level. Well, on the uh, first issue of the post-bond uh, power ministries, uh, the, the, the reality of the situation was that in the aftermath of the overthrow of the Taliban, those forces that were strong on the ground were uh, kind of multi-ethnic but not perhaps uh, uh, equal representation of everyone. Uh, called the so-called Northern Alliance came, uh, were strong on the ground. And that was in part uh, with US help, uh, coalition help. Because the coalition did not want to keep, uh, have a heavy footprint in Afghanistan, they wanted to avoid the perception of occupation uh, at, at that time. But to compensate for that, uh, the Bonn, uh, uh, and not a lot of people who know it, uh, I know, uh, came with the view uh, that was the UN led. There wasn't, we were very influential, but it was a genuinely UN led process uh, that uh, brought a group called the Rome Group that they were the followers of the former King Zayar Shah. Regarded to be more <coughs> uh, from the Pashtun community of Afghanistan. And then, in order to give Pakistan and Iran a role, the Shaw group and their, uh, the, the, the Cyprus group were added so that they would know that there was no cabal here to do something against their interests, so they would be in the picture, so to speak. And what they agreed, uh, what happened in Bonn, was a uh, distribution of power, the, the number one uh, placement of Pashtun. Constitution of Afghanistan and the complaint that some people have centralizes power so much in the, in the presidency. And, uh, uh, and then the other seats were divided. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, yes, the, initially the defense minister, the uh, interior minister, uh, the intelligence chief, the foreign minister were from the Northern Alliance. And that went on a long time. 
I'll, I'll come to that, uh, how long will it go on, because I, I had this discussion with uh, the country that in which you represented us, uh, with the leadership, because this was one of the issues they would raise uh, with me. And, and, and uh, I think uh, uh, that within the first six to eight months, uh, the Ministry of Interior changed hands. Uh, uh, to went from Mr. Khamuni, who was a, a are underrepresented in the government. So I said to, uh, to, to, to uh, President uh, Musharraf, uh, and I saw him uh, once or twice, I said, look, how would you like it if today President Karzai, I mean, I'm just to, between us as friends, would say that particular uh, ethnic group in Pakistan is underrepresented, and if one looks at statistics, I could give, make a case right now to you, I said, as to which two, three groups are underrepresented in what level of your government. And besides, not helpful, because the minute you mention it, it makes Karzai's job, or others who are helping to kind of bring a balance, because the history is clear why this has happened, and, and there is a move to adjust it, it will, it will make it impossible saying you're doing it because of Pakistan's demand. And that doesn't play well politically. And he said, this one, I, this one I completely agree with you, will not say it again publicly, which uh, I think lasted six months or so. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but you're right that uh, it, it took a while. Uh, 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 but I don't know, frankly, uh, uh, whether the reason for the Taliban the rise was that. Uh, because now if you look at the non pashtuns they're saying there's too much power. Uh, I mean, if you look at this, uh, Complaining, the presidency is the most powerful institution. Controls everything: appoints ministers, this, that, and this is in the hands of the. Uh, they think ethnically. The Pashtun, we want a parliamentary system. We want the prime minister's job to be created, and so forth. There is a big debate right now going on in Afghanistan about this issue. So, but but there wasn't a, a reason initially for some of this. Uh, now, uh, with regard to the future of Afghanistan. Given what has happened after the uh, overthrow, during the debate on the constitution and the lawyer Jerga that took place in Afghanistan, Afghans had lived in anarchy kind of thing. He said for a short period of the Taliban, where there was uh, kind of this draconian order, if you like, from our perspective. They were not at that time, except for one or two. about the time when they had a strong government, which was a unitary government, led by the king, although it had the feature that you mentioned, it wasn't strong to how to run things. And I, frankly, I would say right now, whatever I can say about the government being too strong and, and so on, on paper, yes, but, uh, you know, there are several governors that I, I know Karzai would like to get rid of, but he can't because of the reality that you mentioned. So this is, a, to some extent, a made-up debate at this point, in my view, uh, uh, because of other reasons. But ultimately, of course, they have the right, the Constitution allows for adjustments to be made. And I mentioned this to Afghans and to others when I talked to, because I also then, as I mentioned before, then went to Baghdad at the time. They were doing their Constitution, because people think America went with a, its own approach. Uh, what kind of government should come to these two places? Yes, for example. Let's say. And there, they have come out of a government that was very strong, the Saddam's government, and they wanted to not, nothing to do with it. They wanted a parliamentary government, they wanted super majority for any decision so that everybody would have a say. And to this day, Maliki complains whenever I see him, 
that uh, you know, I wish we had the Afghan system here so that he could decide everything himself, but yet they, they, they wanted a, par a federal system, a parliamentary system, a, a kind of a relatively weak central government because they had come out of a different culture and tradition. We have time for two more questions on the topic. I see Yes. I see you might just want to give a brief introduction of yourself because it comes from, you come from another society that's been driven by time. Uh, my name is uh, Sia Raha. I'm uh, from Ethiopia. I know the side of an insurgent in the life of uh, yeah. uh, a government official. Sure. So I can understand a bit the complexities of uh, Afghanistan. I would like uh, to ask you one simple question. Yes, sir. What will happen if American troops will drop despite any uh, framework agreement? I'm raising this question uh, because uh, the American government remains uh, an indispensable ally in the region. Right. Military presence or not, right. the American uh, economic and uh, diplomatic power will be there and it will be demanded. Right. But the American military presence there at this time will be, will provide others a cause for blame. And it used like a target. Sure. But removing them, removing this, uh, this factor, will still maintain the American uh, economic and diplomatic might. Sure. And at the same time, it will give uh, the, the Afghans to sit down together and solve their own problems without the uh, Uncle Sam sitting in, in the midst of them. So, don't you see an opportunity uh, in the case? Uh, <coughs> America, American troops live, uh, even despite any, any other. Sure. Well, of course now we are entering the realm of speculation. Uh, and, uh, uh, my judgment is that if there was no agreement uh, between the Afghan and the uh, government, the other Afghan and the Taliban, and there was a continuation of the uh, regional system as is, all that have been between Pakistan and Afghanistan, in other words, an understanding between Iran and Afghanistan and, and India. Uh, uh, then uh, I see in that scenario, if you take everything else as, as the same and just remove the U.S. military, and, uh, that the balance locally will change uh, in Afghanistan with the side that does, uh, you know, fighting 100,000 plus foreign will equip troops fighting on its side, protecting it, if you remove that, then the balance will the shift, there will be an intensification of the, I might be of the conflict, and more area territory is likely to fall to the side that uh, has been fighting this force of 100,000 plus, and, and, and uh, uh, how it will evolve then, uh, because uh, uh, if you assume everything as exactly the same, which would be difficult then to assume it, because once you have removed a big variable, uh, others will adjust, uh, therefore, but if you, if you assume that the level of support of Pakistan, let's say, it remains the same, the level of response of Iran remains the same, of Russia remains the same, of India remains the same, then uh, the Taliban side will make a lot of progress, uh, but the war will continue. My judgment then is that the others will react to this, uh, because India will be by this uh, Iran, which is now tactically supporting elements of the Taliban, not because it loves the Taliban, no. I mean, Iran was on the verge of war with the Taliban when they were in power. But it's doing so now tactically because it wants to keep us under pressure uh, because of issues between us, uh, I think. Then it will break, in my view, with the Taliban in that scenario because it, it, it Sunni Islam, you know, the Arab Spring has been power to Sunni Islam, Shia Sunni tensions, unfortunately. Have been on the rise, uh, and 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 uh, then there will be a, a regional adjustment. Uh, we should talk about what India will do, what Russia will do in that scenario, because they have different threats than Pakistan. They are not the same. Uh, Uzbekistan would all its play. So it will become maybe in some way similar to the 90s, uh, in my view, where we disengaged. We have had this experience before, uh, uh, and militarily and otherwise, and others play. 
Afghans paid a huge price uh, for it, and, 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 and whether it would lead to a, some kind of a local deal, some say others will, uh, you know, then make a deal among themselves, or it will mean uh, a fight for a long time until one side wins, uh, which side that will be, will it happen, that is, uh, uh, you know, and what it would mean for the, uh, does the Taliban come, what it will mean for extremism and, and for Al-Qaeda, reverse, and all that, those are then questions that one has to uh, postulate on. So that's why I'm not supportive of this uh, option myself. I'm supportive of a negotiated deal why we're in a relatively strong position. Uh, uh, I frankly supported, uh, when we were together, as the Soviets began to withdraw, I supported at that time, I lost to make a deal. Uh, for a government now, before we are out and they are out, because our influence will diminish, and, and then we won't be able to shape it. Uh, uh, but but zero. zero. What? Zero. You, you, you wanted it, and but there are people who said, what? Uh, you know, what are we talking about? Uh, you want us to abandon the forces that gave us this great victory? Uh, so, it, so it, it, But I think that's a lesson for now, in my view as well. That's why I think more emphasis on diplomacy is warranted at, at all three levels, uh, so that that point is clear. Before uh, we go to a level in which our role will become very, very small or uh, uh, in shaping, in shaping. Um, this has been a great discussion. Yeah, we have time for one more question. We've got to take uh, Zal away to his next appointment. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, I wanted to ask a question about Myself from Pakistan, I uh, wondered the same thing. Why has Pakistan not been, you know, the government in Pakistan, not been, you know, pushing the Taliban or trying to fight them more proactively? And uh, in my conversation with people in the government and media, uh, there, there's a couple of concerns that I've sort of uh, found out. Uh, one goes back to the uh, to, to history, the way America, the U.S. left the region in 1989. So Pakistanis almost take it for granted that the U.S. will leave again right. and we'll be dumped in a similar manner and then we'll be left behind with a huge mess. Related to that is the worry that if this kind of scenario uh, you know, materializes, then Pakistan has to hedge its bets right. for that scenario and hence you know, going after the Taliban doesn't make it much sense for them. Uh, another issue relates to the consequences for Pakistan because over the last 10 years, somewhere between 30 and 40,000 Pakistanis have died uh, as a result of the war. That's like 1-9-11 almost every year. Uh, so there's a strategic dilemma as well. If Pakistan fights these Taliban uh, more forcefully, it's going to uh, result in a bigger backlash. So there's a, the dilemma is that if you fight them, there's a bigger backlash. If you don't fight them, then you know, we have these extremists in our neighborhood whom we would ideally not want because you know who wants crazy people in their neighborhood. So but that's a genuine dilemma because either way we're you know damned if you do, damned if you don't, that's a that's a problem. And then with regards to lastly with regards to uh, you know Pakistan's concerns in Afghanistan, uh, there are concerns about so India has definitely been involved in supporting the Baloch insurgency. Uh, you may not be able to talk about it on record. Um, but in addition to that, Pakistanis also point out, and this includes many journalists who are very anti-military in Pakistan, but they point out that you know, some prominent leaders of uh, the Baloch insurgency have been you know, getting protection in Kabul, uh, which raises questions about the complicity of the Karzai government and even potentially the US, because while the US is in Afghanistan, the US too has to take responsibility to ensure that Afghan soil doesn't get Destabilize Pakistan. So these are the three or four concerns that I have tried to identify. I was hoping you could uh, say something about them. Thank well, you. first of all, thank you for a very thoughtful set of comments. Uh, I, I am uh, familiar with, uh, with these issues from talking to uh, many Pakistanis. Uh, some of them are, I think, uh, legitimate uh, uh, dilemmas and concerns. But the way out of them uh, and, uh, uh, has been 
ways in which they could shape it. So why move or do something against them? And therefore, some of us believing that, that that may be a legitimate, genuine concern, have argued for some time. Uh, and even when I was in Afghanistan, uh, before I left for Iraq, we did this strategic partnership declaration between Afghanistan and the United States to say, and President Bush used to say this repeatedly, that we have learned from our mistake of the 1980s. Further, I think in part because of, of this concern that maybe the regional players are all hedging and it's becoming a kind of self-fulfilling uh, kind of day, uh, creating problems uh, in anticipation of something that is, we can shape or influence. That he's talking about a binding agreement uh, under the new strategic partnership agreement that would use the word binding uh, commitment to Afghanistan. Also, have a long-term military presence. That this abandonment idea that should be should be should be maybe be adjusted. Now, people may not believe it uh, in those countries, and regardless of this, uh, America, given how they read our domestic situation, may think no. Uh, but uh, but uh, 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 I, I think there may be a stream of this sort of thinking, perhaps in Pakistan. So the question is. Uh, Abandonment versus facilitating a deal. I have never uh, su suggested to Pakistani colleagues that they need to uh, uh, move forcefully against the Taliban. That's one option. I understand that there might may not be <coughs> domestic completely needed because the Taliban are powerful allies inside Pakistan and they have been around for a very long time and they have developed relationships. The issue that is uh, that is. Uh, Can be dealt with, in my view, would be if Pakistan would come to the following judgment uh, and say it uh, to the Afghans and to the world that we want to facilitate a negotiated deal over Afghanistan, among Afghans, the way uh, the gentleman from Afghanistan has mentioned. We will facilitate, we will encourage, we will facilitate the UN wants to play that role, we will facilitate it. Ambassador Grossman. Play, wants to play that role. Maybe they would say the best way to do it would be through X, but uh, uh, thing. they are very clever. They could come up with an approach that may be uh, even better than these two. And we tell the Taliban that, look, we will help you to get to the table to negotiate, but attacking Afghanistan, the United States forces, coalition forces that are friends of the Pakistan, is no longer tolerable from Pakistani territory. <laughs> the settlement, we will uh, enable you, we will facilitate, which means they will participate in Afghanistan's politics, which means they will even get some positions, perhaps, uh, depending on what the deal is in Afghanistan, which means Pakistan's interest in their relations and influence with them, uh, to some extent, if that's the worry, uh, would, be, would be dealt with. Uh, but the question becomes, why say uh, that the Taliban are not here? Uh, we're not helping the Taliban. We don't like the Taliban. Uh, they are extremists. Uh, they are crazy. Uh, uh, we can't influence them. Uh, but yet, everybody who knows the scene knows that what is, uh, what's going on. Kind of the, that there is assistance, that there is training. So this is where the, 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 the crux of the dilemma of dealing with Pakistan on this is this, because there is a mutual deficit in trust now. Because we now know a lot more than we did perhaps at certain earlier stages as to what's going on and what they say in our view and what they do in our view there is a big gap. I think I have not lost hope. I still believe uh, that there is a way uh, to, to get to an, an understanding with Pakistan on Afghanistan on issues such as the one you mentioned about you know, Afghanistan should not be a, a source of threat to Pakistan by having insurgents from Pakistan be based in Afghanistan. But do you think if, if I was still an American ambassador that I could go to Canada and say, arrest this Baloch guy, you've got one or two Baloch here, and he said, and where is Mullah Omar? Uh, where are all the, uh, you know, I mean, you see what I mean? He will say, you know, what the, uh, given, I mean, and this is what I 
well, saying will happen ultimately because the, the Afghan will do all, uh, will be pushed to do what they shouldn't do because of a reaction. They say, well, you're, uh, if you can't do with the Taliban based in Pakistan, and you know, and by now we've talked enough with each other that we know uh, enough about what each of us know, and why are you asking me uh, to g give up these two who are under house arrest or not doing anything? And, you, know, <coughs> you can see their talking point. Uh, uh, and they have hundreds and thousands of them that are fighting us. So I think they need to come to an understanding with each other. We said with Afghans, Af and the Pakistanis have to also come to an understanding. And these two countries have a lot of common interests in my view. Uh, Afghanistan stability, I mean, a, a, a no-brainer that should be in the interest of Pakistan trade-wise and all the rest. So why it doesn't happen, uh, perhaps we haven't worked hard enough. All right. Well, that was a good, good comment.